welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here and I can't wait to have this conversation with you today. Oh, thank you so much, Tammy. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad we're finally here because we've talked about it for so long. Like I think right, I don't know how long ago you started recording. When did you first do your first? Like, episode? oh, like last year, early last year. Yeah. You know? and, and I feel like even the conversation that we had when we were in Canada of like knowing that this was birthing, but like yes. trying to tiptoe around it and us like recording little different things like, you know, and then, yeah, I feel like the timing of this conversation though is couldn't be better timed. I know that's what's tripping me out too. I was sitting here thinking, when did Sam first ask me? And Vancouver came to mind and filming yeah. in the backyard. Like yep. all of that was there about vulnerability and yeah. look and now, now look at the it. like level of vulnerability in which we're prepared to share like it's epic so yeah. i'm super i'm just glad the time has come for both of us to be here <laughs> yeah i think it was waiting for this because i think you know originally i was in the health space trying to move into vulnerability and not sure what that felt or looked like at the time and now all of a sudden and this links totally back to the conversation that we had in my backyard around um sexuality at the time like i remember asking you what is, what is something that, where do you feel most vulnerable in your life? And you were like sexuality and actually talking about sexuality because it's such a taboo topic for people. And I remember you saying that. And now we're literally here. Like you've come on my podcast today as we're speaking about this topic. Wow. I don't remember that. I just remember thinking, well, Sam, I'm a really vulnerable person. Like I'm not really challenged on, like, I believe that I'm vulnerable all the time, maybe more than others. Yeah. And now what I'm experiencing is like the opportunity to truly, truly see my vulnerabilities. And a lot of them are very, it's a mental thing for sure to be mentally vulnerable as well as physically vulnerable. And that's all coming together through my own sexual expression. So oh, this is so <laughs> the universe cool. is so good. <laughs> I know. And I feel like, I feel like I've learned so much from you on this and I continue to learn so much from you on this topic as you just like catapult through. Um, but like, you know, from when we first met to when like we first met and then all of a sudden we we're in the backyard recording a video on vulnerability and sexuality and all of the things. And now from when I met you then to fast forward a few years of what our group chat talks about you know? <laughs> and like what we speak about in this kind of realm and how much it's unraveling parts of you in su such a magic way. And I feel like even though my journey looks a bit different, it's the same. It's like so much of my own growth is embedded in sexuality and, and, and unraveling the sexual expression and unnumbing. And it's so powerful. And I think it's a really good place to start is around when we first chatted around the vulnerability where you were sitting at that point in time, perhaps it's different now, but the vulnerability brings up for me how taboo this topic is. And I was literally just having a conversation with somebody around how passionate I am about this because of how many, how much we close off and how much we don't want to have these conversations and how much someone listening to this podcast now will do it in secret and they'll, and they'll, and they won't tell anyone they're listening because it's such a, maybe shameful or fearful topic for people what is your take on this like why do you think um why do you think that is and 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 if you've been there before what changed for you so start with like why do you think people are shameful of it well where i'm standing now it's really important to me to claim all of myself and be a hundred percent erin a hundred percent of the time and i'm working really really hard on not having shame and being comfortable to share, of course, with discretion, but being able to share because my path is my purpose and always has been. Whatever it is that I'm learning and growing through is similar to you. It's what we're here to share. And that's not the case for everyone. Yeah. Um, and when I think about how lucky I am in my world to have a group chat with you guys where I get to share with you <laughs> in explicit detail the craziness and the awesomeness and the challenge of what's happening for me in my sexuality. And luckily I have that kind of relationship with my mom even where I can really share vulnerably with my mom and feel very loved and accepted and understood for who I am. But I can recognize that's not the case for everyone. So I'm really lucky to have built a world and to have received through my mom, people that are committed to helping, to trying to understand who I am and why I make the choices that I make. And when I look at other people who 
hold a lot of shame or are very secretive about these things. I look at their world and I think they wouldn't understand. Mm. And they're not necessarily the kind of people that are committed to trying to understand. And so a lot of what I do in terms of teaching, I aim to find, to be able to meet the client or the student where they're at in terms of their level of consciousness or their level of understanding. And at different levels of consciousness, truth changes. So what's true for someone at the very beginning of their self-development journey might be very, very different for what's true for them 10 years down the track. But that doesn't mean that where they were at the beginning is now wrong. It was right. Their understanding was right. And now where they are, their understanding is right. So that makes this paradox of what's now right was wrong then and what was right then is wrong now and vice versa. And so when I use an analogy of being on a mountain to explain this a lot, that when we're at the base of the mountain and we're surrounded by trees and all of us are standing there, we can all collectively agree that we're surrounded by trees because we can touch them and smell them and hear them. And like, it's the collective consciousness and everyone's in agreement. But then as you start to journey up the mountain, you might be able to see beyond the canopy of trees and all of a sudden you can see a body of water too. But if you journey back down and say, guys, there's water. They're like, uh, no, Erin, it's trees. <laughs> Look, we've got this evidence. You're crazy. We're right. You're wrong. You're like, no, 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 you don't understand. There's these trees, but there's also water out there. But that's paradoxical because it's only true at a certain level on the mountain and it's not true at the base. Mm -hmm. And then the further and further you go up the mountain, the greater and greater perspective that you have, the greater understanding that you have. And again, that can be very contrasted to what you understood at the base of the mountain and it can be very conflicting for those people who are at the base of the mountain to then hear you challenge their beliefs. So it's very similar to that. It's like when we're sharing what we're sharing, what is the level of understanding of the people we're sharing with? Because it can be very confronting. It can be misunderstood. They can, If they're certainly not aware of themselves, they can be projecting onto you, blaming you, judging you. But at a higher level of consciousness, they might have more understanding or compassion. Even if they don't see things exactly like you do, they might have journeyed up the mountain long enough to go, well, things change. <laughs> and I understand that things change. And I understand, like, we could be climbing up two different sides of the same mountain and have two very drastic different experiences. So I think people hold that shame when culturally, you know, societally, familiarly, where there has been judgment around these things in the past. And even if you're journeying up the mountain on your own individual journey, it doesn't necessarily make it true for the people around you. Yeah. So true. So true. And I, you know, I, it reminds me of this conversation I was having the other day with some girlfriends as we were sitting, we were on mushrooms at the time, but I feel like that doesn't take away from the fact that we'd probably <laughs> have this conversation in real life. Like, you know, when you're just like, is this mushroom stalking? Um, but we were talking about like, if you, if you think about like what I see, like what I see Erin look like right now, is that the same as what the person next to me sees what Erin looks like? Or like the same Absolutely as like not. The, the color blue, like the way that I see the color blue, do you see the way that I see the color blue or is it different? You know, it's like such a mind fuck <laughs> when yes. you think about that. And it's the same with perspectives. It's the same as like what stories are going on for people and how they're taking in that information or taking what you're what you're putting out or, the, you know? And so I think it's really similar in what you've just explained. And when it comes to sexuality, I think so much of that story is also embedded in what we've been through or how we've been brought up. Yes. And since the beginning of humankind, yeah. <laughs> you know, like sex, the realm of sexuality is so powerful. And it has been used in powerful ways in the past and it's been used in extremely destructive ways and it's been used as a form to control people and to manipulate power. And there's just so much embedded in it since the beginning of time. So we're not just now Aaron and Sam having a conversation based on our, well, for me, 37 and a half years of life. I think you're a bit younger than me. Yeah, I'm 28. You're 28. <laughs> Decade age gap. I remember that now. <laughs> <laughs> you like remember this song i'm like that's right no idea <laughs> <laughs> because it's so irrelevant isn't it on this journey like honestly age is just so yeah. irrelevant but you've got 28 years of collective experience i've got 37 and a half years of collective experience but we are the sum of our family mm. what 
what environment we were raised in based on what environment were our parents raised in. We're both Caucasian educated females. We make up a very small portion of this planet, but there's cultural things, societal things, religious things. So we carry all of that too. We can see that epigenetically that we do carry this in ourselves, our ancestral lineage, but it's just such a deep and complex vast world of sexuality and you know for us to have a lot of compassion as we're navigating it because we're not just navigating it for us we are also healing the women that came before us the women that are standing beside us now who have to listen to this podcast in secret because they're still not ready to be able to comfortably and safely own this part of themselves yeah and i think like that brings up like i feel emotional as you say that because you know even six months ago, there's no way that I would have thought I'd be t- talking about sexuality on a podcast, you know, or, or diving into these realms. Because even for me, where I was at on my journey, it was such a still kind of moving that onto the rug. Like, I'm just going to talk about it to people that I feel safe with because there's still so much. And even still in that space, I wouldn't share all of it, all of it. And it's only from unraveling and why I'm so passionate about this is because I didn't know all of the stuff that was embedded in me healing myself. And it's an ongoing journey. and I'm so far to go and like it's ongoing, you know, but right now I've gotten to a place where I feel passionate enough about it. And I see the value in this and I see the importance in this of what it's doing to us as a society. If we, and if we don't heal that and if we don't look at that and so, yeah, I, I get it. Well, <laughs> I've got a few things I want to say there, Sam. Go. One, when you said, hey, I'm doing a season on sexuality, I'm going to interview you. I was like, fuck. <laughs> like, ah, like that was a growth edge for me too, despite the fact that I'm about to start my own podcast about sexuality. But life gives us little increments to continue to grow. Yeah. And when we're new and when we're vulnerable, we do need a lot of protection. Sharing it only in environments where it's safe and we know we're accepted and loved is really important until it's a bit more grounded than us and we're a bit stronger in it and then perhaps we can go a bit wider and share but this is what I love about our friendship is we do push each other to grow and I remember once you asked me a question (laughs) and I said okay I've got to go I've got to go masturbate and you're like out of interest are you using toys I'm just investigating this right now I was like (laughs) I was so confronted by the question and I was like just be honest no I'm not this time but let's talk about that in the future because I was like I love that even that, like without realizing that's unconsciously kept in secret, you know? Yeah. And then when someone asks you about it and you feel exposed and vulnerable and then you're like, oh, am I really going to tell my girlfriends? And then but also like, Monday why night, am I coming up with that, co- <laughs> like, <laughs> that question? You know, like we also, like a lot of people would be curious about that and, but wouldn't say it out loud, you know? Exactly. And ask that question. Cause it's like, Oh, I can't ask that question. It's like, why? <laughs> exactly. And on Monday night we had, Fem time, one of my girlfriends, Nora, who you have interviewed on this podcast as well, she was saying, I've been really in my masculine with business. Can we all gather together and have some fem time? And we're like, hell yeah. And we sat around and we all talked about how we masturbated. And we all talked, like, <laughs> we just had the most vulnerable and awesome conversations. And like, you'd say something and all the other girls were like, <gasps> really? <laughs> if we don't know these things. We don't know what other women do when they masturbate. And it's such a common part, even if we're comfortable to say, oh, we're masturbating or we have or whatever we don't know how we don't watch each other and then Nora's like who's up for sitting around and masturbating together and everyone's like ah (laughs) it's just like challenge after challenge you know like how far can we stretch ourselves Mm. but I think again the key to all of this is feeling safety and trust yeah hands down we need to feel complete safety and trust and are we surrounded by people that we can have that with that we can build the safety and trust with and that understand who we are yeah and why that we're even asking these questions and support us in our own exploration absolutely and I think like for me even it was such a a journey of studying this you know behind the scenes and reading about it and listening to this stuff before I got to a point where I was like I know that the next step for me is embodiment is like going to you know the yoga of intimacy or sitting in, in a place where it's like starting to unlock it in my body to then feel it experience it move through it but I think you know it's it's great that there's now conversations like this happening where we normalize this, where we don't have, um, where we don't have to feel like, fuck, is anyone else feeling like this? Like, you know, like, and I listened to an amazing podcast um, today, even with Aubrey Marcus and Layla Martin. I don't know if you've listened to it yet, but they definitely listen- not. You well, know me in podcasts. I can't. Yeah. I can't oh yeah, that's right. And this I is struggle. actually so good. Like this is really good. <laughs> okay. I'll um, listen to this one. 
but they talk about like how we're so um where we don't talk about um things that we want in in the bedroom whether it's like ourselves or whether it's other people it's like we have this fear around you know what our vagina looks like or what it smells like or what it like what's going on for us when we when we masturbate or is masturbation okay or is like like all of this kind of conversation that I think I would be so fucking scared to talk about six months ago. And it's like such, it's been such a pivotal moment of my journey to be able to voice it and have a safe space to talk about it in and recognize um, what you do when you actually voice something, you know, like what, what it actually, how freeing it feels to actually say that to someone like say you, and then you'd be like, Oh girl, that's so normal. Like that's so normal (laughs) to like, you know, masturbate that way or like do this or have this, (laughs) have this noise, like, you know? And so exactly. yeah, I, I feel like even if somebody's listening to this right now and not having the conversations or ha- or freaking out of the fact that we're talking about this out loud, like get, I think it's an invitation to be curious. Yeah. And you know, the other thing I really freaking love is privacy mm-hmm. and sacredness at the same time. And just because we're talking about it doesn't mean that we're out there showing it for everyone with absolute disregard. Like we're really selective mm-hmm. and we feel safe and we've built this trust. And I'm really, really happy to share this with your audience knowing that it's for the greater purpose but that doesn't mean that empowering people and encouraging people to talk more means that they ever have to give up their sense of privacy like you and I have really been forming our friendship over years and we have a really deep and solid trust yeah so it has been a safe place for us to ask those questions but I know for me sometimes when people are all about it all up in your face like throwing these very confrontational well not they're not confrontational, but they're confronting things in my face about sexuality when it's at my edge. I feel really put off by that and I want to reject it and I want to judge it and, and push it away from me because it's too much too soon. So for those that are listening that still feel like this is confronting, I just really encourage you to take your time and find the safe people and, and just take it one step at a time. That's definitely be my, this current, um, trajectory of my sexuality is just one step at a time one step and no doubt I take that step and all these freaking triggers come up and I can get really really triggered and then I have to work through that and soothe my subconscious and process what came up but then I feel peaceful and okay and open in that space and then I'm ready for the next step and no one's pushing anyone no one's forcing anyone to do anything without their consent or at a rate faster than what they're doing it just if the curiosity is there if there's something that we're saying that's lighting you up or triggering you, there's definitely work there in both those cases, but just do it at your own pace in the way that feels right for you in as much privacy as you want until you're ready. Yeah. It's so important. I was even like noticing before how I got triggered, like, you know, and it's like so hard to, to be on this and like, and not be blind to judgment, you know, like, and I could be totally making up a bunch of stories about what just happened or what, why this is showing up for me now when I, you know, I was literally explaining to you that I, (laughs) I feel when I share, when I'm on my edge and I share something vulnerable to me, like if I post an Instagram story, which is literally what happened before around sexuality or putting myself out there a little bit with people that may have known me in the past or people that have ex like, you know, people that have created a story of who I am to them, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you become the laughing stock or you become the banter or you become like, you know, the Insta, Insta story gets sent to group chats and you know that there's something going on. And I normally am so fine with it, but when it's on my edge, like something like sexuality, the triggers come up like in it and it's, yeah. and it's such a good trigger for me to look at, okay, why do I care about that today? Like, what is it going on? Like, why do I care that this has just reached my ex-boyfriend, you know, like, and it's yeah. like, okay, it's, it's an invitation for me to explore it to explore why that showed up around this and, and to breathe into it and not like pretend it doesn't exist. And I remember just messaging you and being like, I feel like I'm going to talk myself out of the trigger and pretend that it doesn't exist, but I'm going to feel it and I'm going to dance it out of my body. And um, yeah, I think that we, no matter where we're at on the journey, that there's stuff that's going to pop up that is going to be confronting or be, or, or f- where you feel judged because you're sitting on that edge. Do you 100%. feel that? Yes. So Whenever it comes to triggers, I think the first thing you've done here is not shared from the trigger. And I think that's super powerful because when we are in that triggered state, we're not seeing clear, we're not seeing clearly anyway, because we're seeing the world through our own lens. But when the trigger's going off, man, we are seeing a very distorted perception of what's going on based on our subconscious beliefs and fears and triggers. So you are able to say, hey, I'm triggered. So I think that's fantastic being able to own it 
It's not projecting. It's not blaming anyone else. It's not saying you did this. It's like, wow, I am triggered. This is about me. Number two is calm the subconscious, calm the trigger. You moved your body, which is excellent because you do need to express that energy outwards. For me, being in nature, having a cry, talking it out, cocooning myself in my room away from the world, all of these things. And actually eating, giving myself comfort food, like eating something warm and grounding or some dark chocolate. All of these are really great strategies to calm the trigger. So once you've identified and owned it and then you've calmed it, then you want to work through it. Then you want to be able to say, what was that about me? What inside me, what belief systems were going off just then? And for you, it was probably a sense of feeling very exposed. If you were fearful of being ridiculed for this, it might trigger some not good enough unworthiness. Like they tend to be at the core of almost everything for everyone, along with unsafety. I would say they're the kind of core things, especially in the realms of sexuality. There's a safety component that's massive, Mm -hmm. but it's often around our acceptance in a tribe, you know, it's very primitive parts of our brain that are going off here. It's not the evolved Sam and Aaron that can sit here and talk about this. It's like Mm. the reptilian part of our brain that's getting triggered. So once we can identify what was that underneath there, what's the belief system, and then we're able to work on it. And so at this level of consciousness, both you and I have skills that we can work through it on our own or work through it with each other. But at the very beginning of the journey, it's very, very helpful to have a coach or a healer or someone who's really equipped in helping you work through the triggers because you can get symptomatic relief and that's awesome. But what's the point? Cause that trigger is just going to come up again in the next scenario that brings it up. If you can actually heal it and do the deep in a work that allows you to like pull that weed out of the garden, then you don't have to feel that again. Yeah. So I'm really a big advocate of doing deep, deep, deep in the work with really skilled and equipped people so that when the triggers are up, I know I'm clearing that shit and I don't have to go there again. Of course, the unworthiness one is so big, like we're just doing layer upon layer, but when we're going beyond symptomatic relief, we're actually getting to the core of it. So what would be a symptomatic relief? Like what would be? It's just not feeling the trigger anymore, blocking those people on Instagram. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Well, now I know that I'm not going to have that person on my Instagram story anymore. That makes me feel immediately safe. That might be necessary in order to do the healing is to remove the trigger, but it's not the final solution. Yeah. Because we definitely want to go. It's not about that. them, is it? Like ultimately Correct. it's not about them. So whether they look at the story or don't look at the story, it doesn't matter. But yes. so it's like a it's like popping up for a reason. And the fact that it's happened like two days in a row, it's like, oh cool, it's like really in my face for a reason. Mm-hmm. And I think um what you know, what's the point of the blocking thing? Because yeah. you can show up somewhere else. Exactly. And I'm a big advocate for living in integrity. Like I said, 100% error and 100% of the time. If I'm doing something behind closed doors or in a group thread that I think people aren't going to find about, out about and I don't want people to find out about it, I shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So for me, <laughs> I've been thinking, you know, as I'm preparing to share more of myself online in the realm of sexuality, I had a stalker show up. Actually, that's part of a bigger story. But this guy's at this place and I know that he's been stalking me and trying to meet me and I kept saying I do not meet strangers from the internet and he showed up and he said I'm the stranger from the internet and I felt like it was just a little warning sign to say how are your boundaries how's your communication what actions and choices are you making online who you're engaging with and how's your privacy because no doubt in this world we're going to attract more of that than perhaps if you're teaching about plants (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, like some people would say we're inviting it in. Yeah. That's not entirely true. Mm. Of course, we're not inviting it in, but we do put ourselves in a realm where we know that we're likely to cre- experience more judgment or criticism or trigger other people's stuff. Um, I lost my train of thought there, Sammy. You were talking, oh, so what I would do now, if someone sent me a DM on Instagram, for example, and said something that, violated my boundaries or what I expressed I actually would have no problem screenshotting that and putting that on my stories and I'm most likely going to put in the bio of my Instagram that this is a public forum and behaviors and actions that are if you're engaging me with me in Instagram in any way that I don't hesitate to share it publicly because it's a problem for me if you want to do that behind closed doors and write something crude to me or send me an unsolicited dick pic 
and then think that you can get away with it because you think that it's private when it's not. It's a public forum. So that's in my mind what I'm thinking about doing as a as a demonstration of boundaries is being able to call people out mm. on a violation of my boundaries. So even though the situation you're talking about is not a direct violation of your boundaries, I would have no like what would it take for you to hold your power mm. no matter what? Yeah. How do you're you, seeing something go on. Yeah. How do you like, I think in this realm, whether somebody is talking about it, like we're talking about it right now, or someone's just going on their own journey, how do you discern, how do you create boundaries around it? Like, how do you? <laughs> Such a good question, Sammy. Yeah. Boundaries. I fucking love boundaries. Like I love them. And I can't believe I went so long with such faulty boundaries. Because when you get it, when you have it, all of this power that was being leaked out of you is yours again. And you're not on defense or like trying to squeeze out of slimy situations that don't really feel good. You don't really want that person saying that or doing that, but you don't really know what to do. So a big part of boundaries is communication. But as you know, Sammy, I'm a healer and I work with energy. It's an energetic experience actually when it's a really solid boundary in you, people are going to be responding to that energetically. But in order to get there and on the human levels, it's a lot of the time about having verbal boundaries, um, being able to express your wants and needs. Another humongous lesson in my life. And me too. <laughs> <laughs> thank God my path is my purpose because everyone around me also needs help and support in being able to express wants and needs and feeling safe to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so when that stalker, showed up I before blocking on every channel that I could I felt it really important that I express myself do not follow me do not attend this place do not contact me anymore that boundary is now set and so whatever action is taken again like if you continue to stalk me then it's a very clear violation of my boundaries up until now if I have if I've been a bit wishy-washy it leaves a bit of space for other people to be wishy-washy with us and it's not clear. So that really clear explanation of what's right for me with the recognition that it might not be right for everyone else. There's kind of this defensiveness that sometimes can happen where you're kind of like pushing a boundary out like that because there's a wound underneath it and you're like snapping or pushing. It's a completely different thing to be in the place where you're like, no, that's not for me. And it hasn't made you feel unsafe and it you're not judging the person that, is doing it that's a, a really solid healthy boundary when you can get to that place where you stay neutral where what's happening in my i like to think of it as my kingdom my energy field and i'm the queen in here and i have laws of this land and this is what i want for me and you're the queen of your kingdom and you've got laws in your land that are right for you and we can have two different laws and we can exist harmoniously side by side so one of the really empowering ways the, the way that i love to have a potential lover approach me or someone that's showing interest in me is for them to say, hi, this is who I am. This is what I do, or this is what I'm into. These are my intentions. And here's an invitation to go further with me. If you'd like to get to know me more. I'm like, oh, sweet. No one's come into my land. No one's crossed my boundary. You've basically held up a sign that says, hi, I'm Sammy over here. And I hold a podcast and I do these things and I talk about these things. And would you like to be on it rather than you should come on my podcast. Oh my God, I need you. Oh, da, da, da. And you start pulling at my energy, which is what can happen in the dating scene a lot. It's like, oh, what do you, uh, I got this message the other night that was like, what are your plans tonight, Erin? And I was like, you're a stranger on the internet. <laughs> I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. I don't know what your intentions are. Why would I tell you about myself yet? Mm. I don't feel safety and trust. I would much prefer to say, hey, Erin, I'm traveling through your town. I'm doing this. I'm into this. I'm my intentions are this. I'd love to get to know you more. Would you like to go to dinner? 10 times more likely to say, Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Cause how they act at the beginning is how they're going to act the whole time. So if you are already demonstrating poor boundaries on the first connection, why would I ever share my sexuality with you? Mm. Why would I ever go into the realm of vulnerability if I didn't believe that you were going to ask for my consent? and check in with what's right for me and not just be pouring and wanting at me and like grabbing mm. at me. I had a really good experience of, or a lesson of this last year when I was in the States and I was like, 
literally riding a bike and somebody chased me <laughs> and he chased mm. me and I was like flustered at the like mm. stopped the lights and flustered and then and then in, and then he just like like can I get your number like he's like do you want to like it was just like really fast paced and like and like a get 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 and I remember talking about it with an like an intimacy teacher and and she was like a much more empowering way for a man like to act in that situation or somebody to act in that situation would be like hey can I give you my number and if you're interested, like, feel free to message me because I'm, you know, I, th I think you're, I think you're really beautiful or whatever. And, and I'd, and I'd like to explore this more. So it's like such a different, like all of a sudden it's not like get, get, I want to get your number and I want to do this. It's just like, Hey, like I'm interested. There's my number. Like do what you will with it. And then exactly you know, when she said that my nervous system was like, Oh, thank you. Like that feels better. Whereas in the moment exactly. I was like fight or flight and I was like, I don't know what to do. And I don't want to like reject you and I don't want to do it. And it was all this stuff going on, but it was a lesson for me in boundaries and, and being clear about what's okay because I'm pretty sure I gave him my number in, in, in the moment and then like didn't respond to it or like, you know, like completely had no intentions of wanting to meet him because of that interaction. Yes. I've been followed on my scooter as well in the same kind of way. And this guy kept talking to me and I said, no, I'm not interested. And I'm driving in crazy freaking traffic on my scooter. Like this guy is just following me. But in that moment, we don't necessarily think very clearly and we are put on the spot and we're both like, ah. Uh. And so I ended up driving home. And in hindsight, if when you've got someone following you, going to your own front door is not the place to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I would <laughs> love to empower people. <laughs> exactly. But I pulled over and said, are you following me? I'm not interested. Please don't follow me. And so again, I expressed a very clear boundary and he continued to violate that. And so that is something completely different. That is an abusive behavior to continue to pursue someone that said no. Mm -hmm. And lucky for me, it's a very unfamiliar experience. Often my no gets a no. I'm tall. I'm intimidating. <laughs> I live in Asia where people are very small. <laughs> I often think I'm not, I I don't not. Feel, <laughs> yeah, I don't feel a physical threat on very commonly at all. And I'm grateful for that. But I know for a lot of women that's not the case. So, so you, you want you were, your nose to be yeah, sorry, go ahead. If, if you were to do that situation again, what would you do differently? Drive to the police. Mm. That's what I would have done. Drive somewhere public. And again, expressed my really clear boundary. Um, and what I chose to do is write about it in a public forum without blame and without accusation, but to hopefully at least put that information in other women's mind, because it is a common occurrence here, that they're mentally equipped for that scenario. Because I hadn't thought about it. I'd not up until that point felt unsafe or had a strategy in my mind for how to deal with it. And so the first time, unfortunately, we do often have to experience what we don't like or don't want in order to work out what we do. And so lucky for us, we're learning these lessons in very mild situations where truly we are safe anyway. We're uncomfortable, but we're safe. Yeah. So both you and I were granted a great opportunity. Same with the stalker showing up. Like I never actually felt a physical threat, but it was a signal and it was a warning and a lesson for me to then be more empowered to know that I can, I can make actions and choices now that will prevent me from hopefully having that experience again. Yeah, absolutely agree. So where are you at right now with your, um, I guess with where you're going in your exploration of sexuality? Like how is that? You're just like, <laughs> just look I was waiting, Sammy. I was like, well, this is a very nice tiptoeing conversation. I know. It's like, like I mean, I think I all of that juice? stuff is, I think all of that stuff is really valuable for people. You know what we've spoken about so far, but I also know I want to rip the bandaid off and go deeper because there's so much <laughs> you're exploring that you know, is, is incredibly potent. Yeah. So and where is your exploration? Triggering AF. So yeah, it makes me a trigger warning <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the rest of this conversation is yeah. that this, I am stepping into the world of BDSM and that is traditionally a very perceived as a very dark form of sexuality. Mm. That was what, certainly my perception. What is it for people that might not know? So BDSM is an acronym that represents different aspects of sexuality being bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, and sadism and masochism. So bondage and discipline is self-explanatory. Dominance and submission is about doing a power exchange between two people. And then sadism and masochism is about the use of pain, either inflicting pain or enduring pain, receiving pain. And... <laughs> I like to think I'm an angel, Sammy. Like you I have, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I have come from a lot of darkness in my life. I've been 
I have had physical, emotional and sexual abuse in my past. I've had domestic violence as a child and as an adult. I was a drug addict in my late teens and I've worked really, really, really hard on healing all of that and, and keeping my heart open and being a loving person and feeling extreme gratitude for the life experiences that I've been through that have made me who I am now. But I also just want to stay in the light. Thank you very much. Like <laughs> the world is dark and scary. <laughs> I've climbed out of there, I'm not going back. The other views that I used to have on sexuality were that like I think about vibration and energy all the time. So when I was young, I used to go to these music festivals and push myself up against the speaker and make out with my lover against the speaker, you know, in the density and the gross sensation that was just so awesome. But at the same time, you'd come out of the music festival and you couldn't hear what people were saying. Like, what? Because you've kind of blocked out half of this, your senses because you've gone into such density. It makes me think about taking drugs, more drugs, more drugs, more drugs, and you chase a high that you can never get to because you're just like, <laughs> it's been so extreme. And then as I've gone on this path of spirituality, probably over the last 10 or 15 years, um, you step more into the subtle realms. And when you become an energy healer, you're refining your awareness of the subtleties. So you're moving away from the density. And then if you go to a silent meditation retreat and for 10 days in silence, all of a sudden, all of these faculties open up and you're like, whoa, the trees are talking to the tree. Like you can hear things that you just couldn't before. So when I would think about my own sexuality, of course, I always wanted to move into that realm. Like well, I want more, more, more. Like I want to open up the subtle, not go towards the density where I like hit this point where you can't go further. So my understanding, BDSM bizarrely has been in my world forever, but I was also very self-destructive when I was young, like when I, before 20. And if I had come across this world to the depth that I am now, it would have been very dangerous for me because my self-worth was so low, absolutely no awareness of boundaries no personal power of my own. Like it just would have been a disaster. So thank goodness I had the resistance that I had <laughs> because what I'm understanding now that at the highest level of consciousness, BDSM is both using the gross sensations, the density of the physical body, but also the subtlety. And it's a huge energetic game as well. And the amount of like, subtlety that is there coupled with the physical body blows my mind and now I practice transcendental meditation as my own personal meditation practice and Maharishi often talks about opening up the transcendent level of consciousness as 200% value of life so here we are in the human in the waking consciousness and then we get to add the transcendent as well so we then have 200% value of life and what I'm realizing now in by blocking out half of the sexual spectrum by having this judgment and perception that it's wrong, I haven't been living 200% value of life at all. And I've just been wanting to stay up here in the, in the light and the soft and the easy and the non-threatening and the challenging. And yeah, I'll stop there and see if you've got any questions before I continue. But there is just so much to say. <laughs> I mean, I think that was pretty. <laughs> I think that was like, cool, yup, end. Okay, good. <laughs> it's like on the, I'm continue. on like the tip of okay. my edge. Like, well, I get it now. What else? Like, okay. yeah, go. So as you know, I live my life entirely surrendered in just waiting for the guidance to come in. So four years ago as my marriage was ending, I had this crazy calling to go to Hawaii and I chose to do it. I chose to leave behind the world that I'd built and known and all the things that made me feel safe and successful. And look at me, I'm no longer a drug addict. I have this beautiful home and a beautiful marriage and a wonderful car and a business and all of these external things with which I identified with. Followed this sweet little calling to Hawaii and got cracked open hard. For the next four years, I got followed this guidance all around the world to incredible situations, to incredible people, to sacred sites. And I got stripped of absolutely everything that I had. I got ripped every time I attached myself in any kind of way. Anytime I was like holding on to anything, that would get pried out of my hands as well. And it was four years of emotional and mental destruction. What but would what be I an found, example of something that you would get attached to? A person, yeah. a lover, a, a place of being, a, a belonging, a, a sense of safety, 
And then the calling happens. It's like, nope, we're leaving Hawaii now. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I just felt like I just made a home. But the calling, I cannot deny it, Sammy. There's not a single part of me. What I've seen now is that it ends in such perfection and such magnificence that I could never have created. Why would I ever want the control in my life? Like it has led me to the a life beyond my wildest dreams. So I would feel it and I'd resist and I'd cry. And sometimes I'd say, all right, Aaron, you can just stop. Stop this crazy journey. Just go to your mum's house, lay on the couch and cry. And then I'd be like, no, 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 no. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Like the thought of not doing it is actually yeah. worse. So I'll let myself go through the process and I'll cry and I'll grieve and I'll get upset knowing that when I'm ready, I pick myself up and I carry on with what is being asked of me. What I truly believe is coming through me to allow to come into being on this earth. So when I got stripped back to absolutely nothingness, you get to this point where you recognize that it's actually everything in the nothingness is everything. And my self-worth and my success and has got nothing to do with owning a home and it's got nothing to do with the things outside of me. Like if you take all that away, do you still feel lovable? Do you still feel worthy? Do you still know that you're enough? And that's the place that I found. And now finally my life is starting to build back up in the external again. And I was like, wow, it's happening. And I'm doing it with far less attachment and total acceptance and understanding. I'm so happy to receive it. And I'm okay if it changes because what I've learned time and time and time again is that anytime it looks like it's going bad, it's because it's ultimately getting better. So I look like I'm losing something, but I'm about to gain something. So Yes. This is great for now and I love it. And thank you very much, universe. And I'm open to whatever's coming because you just show me time and time again, it gets better. Yeah. And it's almost like when we loosen the grip around what is, it creates space for like whatever is supposed to come. And I think exactly. we have that such a fear of the unknown and the uncertainty that it's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I don't want to let go of that thing because this is what I know and it feels good right now. And it's like, you know, but like, you don't know what's on the other side of that if you were to simply let it in. And exactly. I think you kind of get nudged in that direction anyway. It's just the grace of it comes with how willing you are to let, let go of the grip. Exactly. And it's so okay if you're not ready and willing. Mm. It's okay to go through that process. But for me, I'll just get a kick in the ass. Like it's happening anyway. So <laughs> get your process okay, done because cool. <laughs> on the other side is BDSM. It doesn't yeah. matter how much you resist it or like freak out. Like, Okay, so the signs kept coming and then you ripped off that band-aid and you went, okay, or you loosened the grip and you went, well, no, okay, no, no, it was resistance the whole freaking way, Sammy, the whole way. And that's where I got to the point where I was like, one step at a time, Mm -hmm. just one step. Like, don't think about the big story that you've made in your mind about what this is, just this. So I had a love affair where we had a very natural, dominant and submissive dynamic. It wasn't. BDSM dominance and submission in that structured format. It was just the way that we express love with each other. It felt very natural to be like that. Mm -hmm. And it, I would say would be some of the best sexuality I've ever experienced in my life. We had an extremely deep trust and yeah, I think the trust was the component that allowed us to express ourselves like that. So that was kind of happening over the space of two years, just gradually and gently creeping into my world. And then the next person to come in said that they were a dominant and this is the world that they were in. And we had an incredible attraction, but we lived in different places in the world. And so it was a mental exploration and we used to be on video calls for hours at a time and it would push the boundaries of my mind. And that was enough, even at that point, to have the conversations about it. Then I'd get triggered and then I'd say, well, I don't agree with this. There's so much violence in the world. Like, why? Why would we want more violence? Like, that's how worked up I was. You know, that's how deep the button was that was pushing. And here I had a friend whose daughter committed suicide at 21. And that really hit me hard. A, because I have a very close relationship with my mum who can become borderline suicidal. And I know what it's like to fear the loss of that mother-daughter bond, but then to see it here in my own life with someone I love who's lost her daughter and she took her life in a violent way so after one of these big three-hour Skype conversations I woke up the next morning 100% triggered bawling my eyes out feeling the pain and the loss of my friend and her daughter and recognizing the violence in the world and then also recognizing that people choose to go to dungeons and be violent to each other. Like, why does a dungeon even exist? (laughs) 
<laughs> but that morning I just knew I had to go by the, be by the ocean. I could not follow my normal routine. I just had to go. And so I went down there and I was crying, just asking the ocean to wash away. And I was just yelling at the universe and just like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you pushing me this way? I do not want to go this way. I'm an angel. I'm an angel and I want to stay in the light and I can't live in the darkness. It kills me. It like takes away all of my power. And I just kept hearing, you're exactly where you need to be. You're exactly where you need to be. Like, no, I'm an angel. I want to be in the light. Like, don't make me do this. So after I just process that emotion, let it move through me, try not to attach to it or make a story, just everything's better on the other side of the trigger. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went and got on my scooter. And as I was backing out of my scooter, the guy beside me was backing out as well. And so I ended up facing the back of him. And his shirt said, do not fear the dark, dark pleasure. And I was like, no. <laughs> and then I'm riding home and I live like 1.2 kilometers from this beach. And this truck drives past me and this big sticker across the windscreen of the truck said, angel in the dark. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what the? And I, I know, and I got home and I was like, no, I'm not doing this thing. And I could hear the universe saying, okay, have a little tantrum. Go, go and pack your little unicorn backpack. Like, <laughs> off you go, run away. Have you got some water? Knowing that I'm, I, I'm not going to ignore the guidance. I just can't. So resist and fight and go through your process all you want. And when you're ready, when you're ready for the next step, the next step's going to appear. And I really, that's exactly I really what's like happened. that you've said this because I talk a lot to like friends and different people around this and clients. It's like sometimes the next step or even self care or self love in the moment is where you're kicking and screaming and you have tears and you're clawing the floor being like, I don't want to go to the yoga mat or I don't want to do the thing. <laughs> but it's like, that's sometimes what self care and self love. And the next part of you is asking for it. It's like, sometimes it's not yes. graceful. It's not pretty. It's not like, it's not somewhere where you want to go, but there it's like, I love that. You're just like the universe is like, okay, like do your tantrum, but we're going to still be here. And it's still going to be the next door that you're going to open. Yes. And it's very loving and it's very consistent and the message doesn't change. And, mm. and that's why I know that it's guidance. If it was just an inkling, if there was any uncertainty there or the messages were changing, then I wouldn't be as confident and as calm to move forward. But it was just like that. And so then I attracted some people in my immediate environment who are in this world. And two of them are total standouts for me because they are exceptional gentlemen and they have an incredible personal boundary. They have an exceptional depth of knowledge about this world. And I was like, oh, I, I was just so taken by someone who's such a gentleman who's in this world. And I said, could we go to dinner? Can, can I talk this through with you? And again, for three hours, I just sat there and said, I get triggered by this and I don't like this. And I think about this and I da, 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 da. And he just very calmly and lovingly and with intelligence was able to share other perspectives with me to help see things in different ways. And this is kind of how I coach my clients too. When the conscious mind is chaos, because you've got these conflicting beliefs and like all of this stuff is I help people reorganize what's in their mind and close loops so that their mind is at peace. And then when you're clear about yourself and your understanding, you're not triggered, then you can see ahead and you can see what's coming. And so as a result of attracting him into my life, I was like, Oh, okay, I'm ready for the next step. And so I went to the next step, which happened to be a Shibari class, which is Japanese rope bondage. And this class was, you know, a bunch of very normal people coming together, learning some technical skills about tying ropes and you got to tie your own leg first. So it's, it's not confronting. It's not anyone immobilizing you or taking away your freedom. And so again, it was just this tiny little comfortable step and oh, I was okay to do that. And as a result of that, I met someone who has now become my dominant, my dom. And I feel like for the first time, <laughs> like I walk around the world, Sam, feeling like I'm intelligent, I'm capable, I, I can do things better and faster and smarter than most other people. So I'll just do it myself. I'll just do it myself. I live alone. I run my business alone. I travel the world alone. Like, I'll handle it. I've got it. Well, I've and got it. actually, this reminds me of a conversation you and I had just a week before I met him where someone had said, you've got to make space for a guy. You've got to, you're a strong, capable, intelligent woman just like I am who can do it all yourself. So we just end up doing it all ourselves. And someone had said, make space. And both of us have resistance. Like, I don't want to 
be less capable than what I am in yeah. order to give some guy the impression, the illusion that there's space for him. Mm -hmm. And the words came out of my mouth, Sam, with the right guy, space is naturally created. Yeah. And I don't mean to be heteronormative there. You know, I, like the right person, no matter whom it is or what kind of relationship or engagement we're having with the right person, there's naturally this space for your growth. So you don't have to be any less than who you are, any less capable, any less amazing. The right person creates space around us. And that's what happened. I met this guy <laughs> and I feel like, like he said to me at one point, who are you? Oh, no, he said, where did you come from? <laughs> I feel like the, I've I said like, that when I met you. Like, who yeah, <laughs> you know, it's my favorite compliment. <laughs> but it was like, he could see me. And there was this one point where we have these rope harnesses on our torso. So your arms and legs aren't restrained, but it's tied around you in these decorative ways. And when the rope rubs against itself, it creates friction and the friction vibrate, vibrates the rope. So you feel the sensation everywhere. So my friend and I, we have these hip harnesses on with a rope that goes between our legs. And so we we're getting tied together. And so that vibration of getting tied together is vibrating the rope between our legs. So my friend who's wearing yoga pants was like, whoa, <laughs> like, wow. And I'm like, eh. I'm wearing denim shorts. Like I can feel it, but it's like, you know, plus I'm in a public place and it's my first time and I'm slightly <laughs> nervous. So I've got my walls up and I'm being a bit shy. Like I'm not just going to like numb myself. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The brakes are on, as I now understand yeah. about my sexual desire. These are some of the situations that don't really allow my sexuality to, mm. I didn't feel safe yet. I didn't yeah. trust everyone. I didn't know everyone. So I'm just holding back a little bit. And basically someone else took over and said, here, I'm going to try that. And as he pulled the rope between us, it was very intense. And my friend just like jumped back and was like, whoa, 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 whoa. that is way too much, you know? And it got a bit defensive. Like I don't want to hand this situation over to someone that oh, you know yeah. can't read me and so again my dom took over and he said no actually she pointing to my friend likes really subtle sensations like this or like this and just move the rope in these subtle ways and without even looking at me it was like she likes it like this and like yanked the rope in a certain way and i was like <gasps> oh my god i was like who is this like we're in a group full of 30 people where I'm hearing, Oh, like, do you have an investment portfolio? And like, where do your kids go to school? And like very normal conversations, everyone just learning technical skills. And I feel like someone has been watching me when I've been trying not to give anything away and can read me to that degree of accuracy. And I feel like that was the moment where we really saw each other and we're like, you're just like me. You walk around this world with a very large capacity where you don't often meet people who can really meet you and match you. And we're both like, who are you? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I don't even know what question to bring up right now, but I want to like understand why ropes, like why, why ropes, what does that do for you in your sexuality? What does that bring up for you? Why do you go back? Oh my God. I can't, I don't know, Sam. The first time, so he came to my house the next day and tied me. And all I can tell you is my brain, which would have, it had all these anticipations that I'm going to feel triggered. I'm going to feel restrained and I'm not really going to like that. And I'm going to have to express my, da, 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 da. none of that was present. I, it felt so normal to me. And my brain just said, everything in the world makes sense. It was a very transcendent experience for me. And, you know, when I first started practicing yoga, I would wake up in the middle of the night with Sanskrit words in my head and I had no idea what they were. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd write them down and then in the morning I'd try and work it out. So I felt like something was unlock unlocking inside of me that I already knew. My soul knows this. And then I went on to become a yoga teacher and I feel like the same is happening now. There is a part of me that has known how to use sexual energy to create transcendent experiences and how to use sex to reach God. I've known this somewhere at some time in my soul and it's now my time to come back to it. Mm -hmm. So what happens now is I smell the rope or I touch the rope or I hear the rope because it kind of creeps against itself and I immediately start getting downloads, like immediately. And I'm like, oh my God, I need to do this for clients. I need to create non-sexual experiences 
of safety and trust and surrender for the women who are so guarded and, and so defended because they've never known safety. I know what I can hold within myself. How I often do a lot of healings is I go inside of myself to the place where that unconditional safety exists. And then I ask to be shown, how do I lead this person there? And then they get drawn or inducted into my energy and they feel it. They feel what I feel. So I can take them to greater heights of safety and greater heights of trust and greater heights of consciousness and love than they've ever known before. And now I don't even ask to be shown. I just literally hold that energy, which is why I call myself MDMA in human form. Because when I get that connected to the universe and I am channeling God like that, it's like I've had drugs and it's so euphoric and I can pull people into that. And we both sit there so freaking high and our hearts so open. And I was like, oh, this is actually what BDSM is or can be. It can be at a certain level on the mountain. It's not true for everyone. (laughs) But when I surrender and when I submit, I am surrendering inside of myself into the part of me that is God, that is source energy, that is all that is. Okay. This is so powerful because, you know, as a powerful woman, as somebody who is like, you know, naturally wanting to create impact and, and has a, has a great capacity to, you know, hold power and to, and to heal and to impact and to be successful. Right. Often it's a really hard thing to do to surrender. And I think in intimacy, especially we begin to build up this wall, even if we're in long-term relationship, you know, it's really hard to let our fullness out because we build up this wall around, I'm going to lose control if I fully surrender and I don't know what's on the other side of that. And so it'll be better if I just like, don't, you know, so then often we become the dominant and we be blah, blah, blah. So how do you, how do you navigate this in, in the way in which you, you are still this powerful woman and yet you're able to fully trust and surrender? Like, where does that, how does, how did you navigate that? Well, my dom said to me, I believe that you are a naturally submissive person and it's just that life made you otherwise. Oh, okay. He said, we are just allowing you to make contact with your true nature and forming new neural pathways and building upon positive experiences to allow you to experience this part of yourself, which up until now, it hasn't been safe to do so. (laughs) I know. I know he is phenomenal. He, I don't know. I am just blown away with the magnificence of this man and his mind. So when I look at my past, it was really unsafe for me to have power in other people's hands. I was abused as a child. It was unsafe when other people were responsible for me. So when I started having some ability to be responsible for myself and have my own power, then why the hell would I let anyone else do it? Because it hurts me. It has hurt me. It's demonstrated for me that other people can't be trusted. Just do it yourself. So it's very, very true now that I can't let my full capacity out into the hands of someone that's incapable of holding me. That still is true. But I, I say that from a loving place and a a non-judgmental place, just a recognition of the energy exchange is that that's not a suitable vessel for me to pour myself into. But when I have now, thankfully, the universe has guided me. Like these are my first experiences into this world with people of this caliber who have this incredible mental awareness, but this emotional capacity as well, this emotional intelligence and empathy as well to meet me, not just in the mind, but in the heart and in the body. It's now a safe place for me to say, okay, what if I let my wall down just a little bit? What if we just go a little bit further one step at a time? And then building upon the positive experiences, that's like the real key. It's like we are training our body, our nervous system, our mind, our neural pathways to say, when I'm not holding up my walls and my defenses and actually I allowed myself to be submissive and I had a really positive outcome. How do you And then do you that come back to normalcy. Sorry to cut you off there. How do you let you... Yeah, like what happens for you in that moment where you go, okay, I'm, I feel safe enough right now to let down a wall. Like what is something that you do in that moment to do that? Well, for me, when the ropes come out, you are handing, yeah, you know, you're handing over your power. You're like, yeah. it's like, well, I'm going to be immobilized or partly immobilized right now. So that's a willingness before it's even happened to say, okay, I'm handing you some of my power. 
So essentially what happens in the power exchange, the submissive is the one holding the power and it only ever happens if the submissive has asked for it. That's why asking for needs and wants and consent and having a negotiation about what's about to happen is so empowering. And I want everyone, no matter how you express your sexuality, to feel capable and and want to have those conversations and make it part of foreplay. Like, what do you like? What would you love to try? What, what don't you like? What are your absolute no's? Like, I really like to be pleasured like this, or, you know, what I'd really love to try is this. Like, it doesn't have to be some dry, harsh, cold conversation. It can be a really erotic one as well. Why do we have do you want so to say much, something? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. like go deep. why do we have so much fear around asking or sharing what we want in that space? Because often there's like a few things that show up here. A, we can't do it unless we're drunk, right? Like we can't do it unless we've had some drinks under our belt or B, like we'll just settle for like a, a really vanilla sex life because we don't know how, or we don't know, or we don't know how to actually articulate that. I'd really love someone to tie me up right now or whatever. Like, you know, why, how do we, how do we do that? Great question. The reason we don't ask is because the consequences of hearing a no will often trigger a belief system that we don't want to feel. So if I ask you, I really want you to go down on me and they say, not interested in that. It's like, Oh my God, I feel so unworthy. I feel so unattractive. I feel so undesired. It's like we have tied up our worthiness, especially as women, we have tied up our worthiness with our desirability. So if I say something here that's going to potentially jeopardize your desire for me, I'd rather not say anything than say it and then deal with the consequences that I could feel like shit. That's almost the whole reason why anyone does anything in the world is to avoid feeling the feelings that they don't want to feel. Yeah, it's, it's almost like similar to telling someone that you, you like them or you love them or that you want to date them. Or yes, them rejection. Like, oh, shit, but what happens if that's not a mutual thing and then what are they going to say? Exactly. Mm. So, A, identifying that our worthiness and our desirability and our good enoughness and all of that stuff is not dependent on the other person and that actually we're free to ask for what we want. They're free to ask for what we want and we're both empowered to say yes or no. Mm. Like that again, comes back to who are we asking these things? Are they at the level of consciousness where they can have that conversation? Maybe they're not. Maybe they're super triggered as well and have never been able to put words to their desires or wants or needs. And we've got to be the leader there. We've, it's up to us to create the safe space to start asking and start having that conversation. But I would always suggest have this conversation outside of the moment. Ooh. Because when you're in the moment, when it's already starting to happen, it's like it's already on. And what used to happen before consent was a thing, like it is now, this verbal consent and enthusiastic and ongoing consent, it would be like, I'll just try and touch you like that and see if you like it. I might just put my hand down your pants and just see if you react positively or negatively. That's how we got consent. <laughs> That's what would have happened when you and I were losing our virginities. It would be like, we'll just kind of touch here or there and see how that person's responding. Mm. or someone's touching me like that and I'm just kind of freezing up because I don't really know what to say and I don't want to let them down and I don't, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So in the moment is just a terribly tricky situation that's almost guaranteed to not get the results that we want. But if we can make this conversation something that we could have out to dinner or in the morning or over breakfast or coffee and just like have it without the pressure on it, it becomes easier. So one of the things I recommend in BDSM is to have a list of yes, no's and maybes. So within your own desires, getting really clear on the things that you know that you like, the things that are a no or a hard no, and what are the things you might be interested in exploring. So what goes in my maybe category? And then you would come to me with the same thing and you and I would sit down and say, oh, look, well, we both like all of these. These are all in both of our yes columns. These are the things that are off the table because they're in the no. And what are our maybes? And then we can have a look at where is the alignment and maybe you and I want to explore rope together. Maybe you and I, Sammy, explore rope in a non-sexual way together because you're like, actually, I would really like to do that with you, Erin. You make me feel safe. We've got trust. You've got this crazy spiritual perspective about everything that you do and you're going to help me see BDSM as a pathway to God. That's awesome. I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas someone else, you might be known for ropes. Yeah. Because it's, it's contextual. Mm. So it really depends on the kind of history that we have. It depends on the kind of day that we're having, you know, yeah. like if I'm triggered, I'm not going to go and try something new. And I love that it can be, it's a no right now. Like, you know, for me, like 
it might be a no right now on ropes, but like in a month's time after watching your journey unfold, maybe I'm like, actually now I'm curious to tip my toe in there or see what that's about. And I feel yes. like that's why ongoing communication with your lover or whoever you're yes. doing it with is like so important. What yes. I want to go back to and what I really like what you said is like, don't have the conversation in the moment because yes. that I think is really valuable feedback because in my head I was thinking, how do we do that? Like, how do we have these, yes. like you're in the moment they're like, Hey, like, can I do this? And you're like, Oh my God. Like, you know, it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> But then I think there's a yeah. lot of fear that comes up around actually bringing it, like just, you know, sipping on your, to on your like tea and having av avocado on toast. And you're like, Hey, like I really want to explore ropes one time. Like, um, you know, I've got a few strategies. Yes. Yeah. I think strategies would be key, like important to like talk about. And also I love that you said you go away, you look at your yes, no, maybes, and then you come back and then you have that conversation because another question I was going to ask you was how do you, how do you react if your dom came to you and said, I want to explore this, but it was a hard no for you. Like, how do you, how do you say it's a hard no without triggering a wound of rejection? You know? So uh, my yeah. Uh, a self-aware Dom would never, ever, ever be rejected by that. Mm -hmm. Never. It's just not even a thing. <laughs> That's what's so empowering about it. Yeah. They're so aware that they're, helping craft an experience that's about you ultimately. So it is a submissive with a power and then we willingly hand it to the dominant and the dominant feeds that energy back into us. We are the vehicle for the pleasure. Mm. So energetically, I'm the one that's having all of these hormones released in my body. Essentially it's like biohacking I've come to discover because when I get high and have my MDMA in human form spiritual experience, my brain is flooded with hormones. But is it the hormones that create a spiritual experience? Or does the spiritual experience create the hormones? Mm. doesn't really matter. It's a chicken or the egg. So BDSM is a way of deliberately releasing hormones through the body in a set way to create an altered state of consciousness, which they call subspace, which is exactly what I would call going to God. It's like a wordless place that is far beyond this physical experience. So the Dom is like, it was explained to me like the submissive is like the child on Christmas day and the Dom is like the parent. It's like, the, it's a, mm. the scenario is created by the parent for the child to have this experience. So the dominant is creating this experience of pleasure for the submissive. So of course this can be expressed at low levels of consciousness. And of course you're going to get people who are dominant, who are just trying to get power out of other people and play out very unhealthy relationship dynamics, but at a high level of consciousness and with people that are well-trained and well-experienced, it would never be a thing for you to have no's. It just is not even a thing. And so if you weren't practicing BDSM though, and you mm -hmm. were wanting to have a, a conversation with your lover around, this is what is a hard no for me, or this is what I want to practice, or this is, this is a desire that I want to try and explore with you, but you're scared of rejection or you're scared of how they're going to respond. Mm -hmm. A, is there a way in which you can bring that to the table? And B, is there a way if you were on the other side of that, if, if your lover came to you and said, I really want to explore this, but it wasn't right for you, is there a way in which we can express without let it, like, without it being like, it doesn't mean I love you less. It just means that mm. that's a no for me. Yeah. So some people find texting or writing much easier with communication because it's allowed you to get clear on what is right for you in your own time. And as you deliver that information, it allows the other person to receive it without having to respond immediately. And then they can craft their response. So some people actually find with their DOM that they have a text message thread or a shared journal where they do their communications that way because it just creates another little layer of just safety and security in expressing a very vulnerable part of yourself. So that can be one strategy is to move this kind of conversation to writing, although you can lose some of the intricacies of what we're trying to communicate through writing. So it does have that potential negative there as well. Another friend of mine, what she was interested in doing is opening up her marriage um, and was very scared and knew she was putting everything on the line, but this is the truth of her heart and you cannot deny the truth of your heart. When we have these desires inside of us, I've had these desires my whole life and thought that I didn't. That's the craziest thing. You could ask me, what are the dirty things in your mind that you want to do? And I'd be like, nah. <laughs> kind of maybe pick one or two things. But then as I've been doing my research, I was like, Oh no, I've had, I fantasize about that. I fantasize about that. I fantasize about that. I've, all of it, all of these aspects of being submissive, but because of my self perception that it was weak and that it's wrong and that people can't be trusted. If 
like my brain shut it out. It was like, I could use the fantasy in the moment to get myself off. But then as soon as it was done, I was like, nope, wrong, bad, shut that back down. And I was like, no, no, I'm just a good girl. I'm just an angel. I don't, I don't think like that. It was like my brain was tricking me. And, you know, I was in a same-sex relationship for a long time. And in the gay world, you see it a lot too. People that are closeted, they deny this part of themselves for a very long time. But one day it is ultimately going to bubble out of us because it is the truth of who we are and it's not bad and it's not wrong and it's absolutely okay. Whatever the desires that we have when they're expressed in a loving way and with consent, none of it is bad or wrong. So when people have this stuff inside of them and they're like, oh my God, I'm so scared I'm going to lose love. If I'm true about who I am and what I want, they're not going to be happy. They're going to get hurt. They're going to think I'm disgusting or there's something wrong with me. I'm going to lose this relationship. We just shut it down. But ultimately, one day life is going to have its way and life wants to express energy through that vessel in that way because it's beautiful and it's perfect and it's nature and it's just this force is flowing through us. So in some ways, I want to say if things collapse as a result of you being true about who you are, that's because something better is coming. That's something that we need to let go of and that's really hard to hear in the moment that being true about who I am might mean that I lose my relationship or I lose love. But just know that that is not a fantastic relationship to be in if you cannot be who you are. That's not truly a loving relationship. That's a conditional one. So don't be so afraid if things go badly because that's a short-term thing and a much longer-term picture is that one day you can be fully yourself and be fully loved and accepted and desired for all of yourself. Um, Oh God, I have so much to say, Sammy, now I've lost my point. So you're asking, how can we say it if we're afraid that person might judge us? Right, so my friend who wanted the open relationship, she had a fantastic article and she said to her husband, I would really love if you could read this. So it was like a, a gentle introduction of a concept that wasn't yet a threat. It was like, could you read this and let me know your thoughts? And then he had time to consume that information, get clear on his, his thoughts about it opened his mind to new potential he hadn't thought of. And he came back and she's like, this is what I want for us. And he was like, okay, I think I can do that. I think I'm willing to try this for you. So she took a humongous risk yeah. in authentically expressing who she was and she got a very positive outcome and I'm super happy for her. But maybe that's not the case for everyone. Maybe in taking that risk and putting everything on the line, we might go through a more negative experience, but ultimately it will be okay. It really, really will. So Sometimes just planting those seeds or bringing those ideas into the consciousness of the relationship might be like, hey, did you know so-and-so? They do this. What do you think about that? Or have you watched this movie? Have you read this book? And you, you start to open that person's mind to something without it being a direct request for them to change because I think that's what's threatening for people. It's like, you, I'm not enough. Yeah. Like, don't you want me as I am? And that's not the case. That, they're just very unhealthy code, uh, codependent relationship dynamics. But unfortunately, not many people, not many of us have had really great demonstrations of what healthy relationships look like. There aren't necessarily families that are raising, certainly in our generation, we didn't have people talking about consent like this and desire like this. So unfortunately, many of us are in unhealthy codependent relationship dynamics without even realizing that there's something better or a better way of communicating. So yeah, sometimes, unfortunately, it is going to go difficult. It's going to I think not be so easy. Yeah, but I think that's really good feedback and help in how you can kind of navigate that. And I think, I think you know, a question that I sit in a lot is, am I willing to, am I willing to withhold what I want to experience because I'm not willing to take a risk? You know, it's like, am I willing to settle for the potential of someone or am I willing to settle for what I'm experiencing now? And it's a valid question. If the answer is yes and awesome, but sometimes I'm like, fuck, like I have to take this risk and it might hurt and it might not be how I want it, but at least I know it's going to get me closer to where I want to be because I'm not exactly. withholding. And I think I used to sit in the withholding seat. And so I think we just have to learn to take more risks in life. That yes. And story. maybe for some people, they really can deny the truth of who they are and have safety and comfort. And that's cool. And it carries that's on. Yeah. Maybe that's the case. Yeah. It is absolutely not the case for you and I. Life is going to have its way. That, you know, there's something, we are brave and courageous women and it hurts. You get to the point where it hurts to deny who you are 
mm. out of fear. The risk to change is yeah. no longer the same amount of risk because the pain that exists in denying what you want. But having said that, I didn't even know that I wanted to be submissive. That's a crazy thing. It was like life had just led me down. It was like, hey, look at this thing. Yeah. And wow, that is actually who I am. And it's wonderful to meet that part of myself in a really safe way. And it's not at the expense of the other part of me. I'm still equally as capable and independent and strong and assertive and a natural born leader. And 200% value of life, I'm also submissive. And that's amazing. What has been at this point in your journey of where you're at exploring this work, what has been the most valuable lesson? Sharing the most, what feels like the most shameful, vulnerable parts of myself and feeling that love does not change. Mm. To go into an experience of humiliation or degradation, which is another aspect of power exchange, to put me in a physically, uh, in a position that exposes me and feeling equally loved. Yeah. Like you're now seeing the parts of me that I've been hiding my whole life and nothing changes. You still love me. Your heart is still open. Oh. The only times I'd ever felt humiliated was when someone was trying to hurt me. When I was being bullied at school, and people are using this power of humiliation to take your power away. And here it's like, can you expose yourself fully to me? And, then and be- oh God, you're just like, it's so hard mentally, so hard mentally to put yourself, your physical body into a submissive position that exposes you somewhat or exposes you extremely. And then to know that you're equally as loved. And not only that, but then you close it out with aftercare. Oh, okay. I was ready to wrap up this and now we've opened up a fucking Pandora box. Okay. We just have okay. to split this into Let's, multiple episodes. Oh my God. We're going to... too fucking good. I, yeah. I was going to say, we'll have to come back as a part two, but the part two is happening now. So... Uh, <laughs> Welcome to part two. <laughs> Hope you had a nice break. We didn't stop. <laughs> um, aftercare. <laughs> Talk to me about this because Go. I have a lot of, a lot to say on this too. Right. What is, after, what, is, what is aftercare to you? Well, let me tell you about the first time someone told me about aftercare. I had a client who was in this world and shared a lot about her experiences in this world. And as a space holder, you have to be able to hear what they say and not make it about you. And sometimes that's really triggering. And so this client was saying that she went and had a BDSM scene in a hotel with someone that she met from the internet. He didn't honor her safety word. And then he left and she had a sub drop and she was all alone. So a sub drop is when those hormones that have got you all super, super high, then come crashing down the other side because you haven't regulated back to normalcy. So I have only heard of aftercare being used in an abusive situation or the lack of aftercare in an abusive situation. So when it came up to me, came up for me again at this stage of my journey, I was like, well, I freaking hate the fact that we're even doing things that need aftercare. Like, that's my problem with it. Why do we need aftercare? And the response was every vulnerable exchange needs aftercare. <laughs> oh, my heart. Like, oh. And she, she said to me, don't you provide aftercare for your clients? And I was like, yeah, of course, without even thinking about it. If you had come to me upset, Sammy, the next day I'm going to check in. It's like, it's just common sense that we care but what often happens in the dating scene the mainstream kind of sexual scene that you and I have been a part of up until now it's like not even a concept and how many times have we exposed ourselves vulnerably shared a vulnerable part of ourselves and then felt a disconnect they leave they don't message you again they just got what they want and they're done Mm. And it leaves us feeling extremely raw and exposed. So aftercare should be commonplace. And I would encourage everyone to ask for it is to say, do you want to come back to my place tonight? But I'd really like you to stay for breakfast. Or do you want to come back to mine? I know you've got to leave, but it's really important for me that you check in with me tomorrow. Like mm-hmm. ask for whatever it is that you want. When someone's leaving your house and you kiss goodbye, just say, could you text me tomorrow? I know that we would just love everyone to just do the right thing for us the right time without having to ask, but 
that's not ever going to happen because no one can read our mind. And it's so simple to ask and it feels so good to receive what you need. Okay. Oof, that's so big. And that's so potent. And I want to start with like, um, it's so common, like right now, like if I have a vulnerable moment and it's not even in intimacy, it's just in, I've had a very emotional day and I've yeah. expressed myself to somebody, then who I choose to express myself to is somebody that I feel safe and that I trust. Right. And so yes. without a doubt, without me even asking, I'm going to get a follow-up message the next day, whether it's from you or some other person that I trust is going to check in and say, like, how do you feel? And it just feels good. It just feels like, Oh my gosh, like that person cares. And like, I feel held in that space. Yes. And I think, I think what I have learned is you've just actually opened my mind up in that situation. It's like, a, I feel like I've been dropped many a times in intimacy mm. because I, I haven't, but I haven't asked for it. Right. I haven't <laughs> said like, I really loved this moment and I'd really love for you to check in tomorrow. Like I'd really love yes. you to text me. Like sometimes like for me, like the biggest thing is literally just communication. Like if you, if we're not going to continue this or whatever, like, cool, I just need to know about it. Like don't keep me guessing yes. or don't like, yes, not just like close this loop, like close the fucking loop. <laughs> yes. Um, but I think aftercare, like whatever vulnerable intimate moment that you've had, whether that's going somewhere, whether that's not going anywhere, whether that's like with a lover, whether that's one night stand, whether that's an accident, whatever, it's like the follow up is so, so key. And I don't know if that's maybe just more for women. Like, is that something that you found that more no. women need or is it, should it go yeah. both ways? Well, both of us have been vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So both of us will have needs afterwards. And I've been talking a lot about dominance and submission, but it doesn't have to be that way. In other BDSM scenes, it can be the top and the bottom as well, but it's not just the person that is the submissive or the bottom that's been vulnerable. So yes, we have needs, but so does the dominant or the top. So aftercare in the realm of BDSM is actually about the hormone re-regulation. So there's like, usually you would just have a cuddle. Some people don't like touch, so maybe that's not the case, but like a cuddle and you talk, and you can be praised and you can talk through what it was like and did you really like it? And like, wow, I tried some of my maybes and like, you know, that really just wasn't it for me. It wasn't what I expected or I was challenged in this way. And so you're, you're closing the loop, like you say, but it's also giving the body and the brain a chance to re-regulate because you've had adrenaline pumping through your body, dopamine pumping through your body, all the like good oxytocin feelings. So we're just coming back very safely and gently back to normalcy. And what I realized for myself is I get so high so easily. I resist the coming down part. Like, why, why, why? I'm just going to stay up here on MGMA all the time, connected to the universe, buzzing through everything. But when I don't, when I haven't re-regulated, I do, I crash down and I crash. And then I have to build myself back up. And so what my Dom had suggested to me is find the things that help bring me back down to earth and ritualize it. So what are the things that really work for me? I know physical touch is really good maybe having a bath or a long, warm shower. I personally don't like to eat after these experiences when I've had these kind of stuff moving through my body. My body's not really in an eating mode, but a cup of tea might be nice. Music, chanting, like the, I'm such a textile person, you know, like I love I'm a tactile being by nature. So like soft blankets, mm. soft sound, like all those things that I love, sound, smell, sights, touch, talking. Mm. all of that is going to help me just come back for as long as it needs to be. Mm. So that's what aftercare is. And that's why I would love everyone to experience that every time they're vulnerable. So it's beautiful because in there you have a solo practice. You have like aftercare is what you do for yourself to bring you back mm -hmm. to harmonization. And then mm -hmm. you have us asking for what you need mm -hmm. from the other person. So let's say somebody's listening and they're not in a setup, right? They just have a one night stand or they have an experience mm. where, um, and I also, I think this is super important in long-term relationships as well. You know, if you've just mm -hmm. had a very intimate moment and vulnerable moment, like I love what John Wyland talks about on this. He's like, you know, if you've, if you've opened up your lover and, and their heart is fully open and you've had mm. an incredible experience the next day, you're leading them the whole day. Like you're saying, Hey baby, like I'm going to make you coffee and, and tea or breakfast or whatever. And I'm going to go away for six hours and I'm going to message you at lunch and I'm going to check in, make mm. sure you're all good. Amazing. And, then, and then at 6 PM, I'm going to meet you here 
and then we're going to cuddle for a bit and then we're going to go for dinner. How does that sound for you? What else do you Oh, That's making my heart do amazing right. things right. because Me what too. happens is that forms trust and safety. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we don't feel trust and safety, we pull our energy back. Yeah. We're like, I don't trust you. I don't know that I'm safe here. Yeah. So essentially all that work that you've done to open and to connect is lost in a moment if they acted in a way same with ropes like if they do something that you feel like they're going to drop you yeah. like they don't have you they're about to hurt you you break the trust and you pull your energy back so the energy exchange the power dynamic bolts mm. in that moment just like that i remember having a conversation with my teachers in la around like i think i'm really good at justifying right like people's behavior because i can understand who they are or what they're going through all their star sign mm. or whatever mm-hmm. and i remember, <laughs> you know you justify it and you don't feel the ouch and I remember having an experience with, with somebody that I had a connection and, you know, was seeing for a bit and he opened my heart up so much and we had this incredible experience and it was like fully open and I felt like the juice of it and I felt alive in the moment and I was completely dropped the next day, but I stayed in it and I stayed in it and I stayed in it and I kept reaching out and I kept reaching out and ultimately like you could call it ghosting or whatever was going on. But, um, I got, I got extremely hurt without realizing because mm-hmm. I was just intellectualizing it, not realizing what it was doing to my body. Yeah. And they told me that in the moment, right? Like my heart opened, but when you're dropped like that, it closes, but closes like tenfold. So the mm. part of which what was opened has now been closed again, but there's also another layer on top of that. Yes. And I was like, shit, like I just worked so hard to get to that open part and that openness and trust of this person to lead me there. And he did, he did an amazing job of leading me there and opening my heart. And I, you know, it was an incredible experience, but then because of the aftercare wasn't met and the communication wasn't yes. there, I, I, I threw on an, a whole other bit of armor that now I'm yes. still in the process of unraveling. But I think that is what can happen if we're not aware of a, I didn't, I didn't say, there's I'm taking responsibility now of going I didn't actually say to him what I really need from you is to just like check in tomorrow or whatever um and but I think having an awareness that that's what people need and and to be able to get into the forefront of that is going to really help us to open further yes it reminds me of something that um the guru in this ashram I was in in India said to me it's like Erin your heart is the most precious jewel you only put it in the hands of a jeweler. Even if someone is the best woodworker on the planet, they cannot hold your jewel. He's like, keep it open. Everyone can see it, but only ever place it in the hands of a jeweler. So we can be open and soft and feminine and, and vulnerable in the world and in a way that allows us to continue to stay open no matter what's happening outside of us. But what I would say is like placing the jewel in the hand of another is a power exchange. And we want to know, I almost see it like dialysis. I work so hard on my energy. (laughs) I am so proud of the energy that I can hold within myself. If I'm feeding it into you to get it back like a dialysis, then I need to know that that, oh, I just got an Instagram notification of an old mama saying, I want to cuddle. Oh, (laughs) that's so cute. Oh man, thanks. What great timing. (laughs) But yeah, if that energy is feeding back into me, then I need to know that that's the kind of energy that I want that offers me something that can either match me or improve me in some way. And that's why I say on my FetLife profile, which is like a Facebook for people with fetishes, it's like this website, a closed website where you become a member, but you get to share what your kinks are and you find other people in your area and blah, blah, blah. And I really explicitly say in there that I'm not interested in power exchanges with people who do not have a strong sense of self-esteem and self-awareness and know who they are. Mm. Like I only want to, I feel like that with my job, we are such equals outside of the dynamic. We are incredibly well-matched. You know, we both bring so much to the situation. There's things that I, gifts that I bring and teachings that I bring and there's gifts and teachings that he brings we both have so much to share together and then we go into dynamic. So I know that that's the kind of energy that I want to combine my energy with. Mm. So I think a lot of us do just take our jewel and like place it in the hands of another and go, here, go take care of me. Like, let me just throw it at you. Even if you may never have held a jewel before. And if that person is freaking out or like not capable or intimidated or like going through their own stuff, that's, we put ourselves in a position where we can get really, really hurt. I think a lot of women have done that because we yearn so deeply for that experience of someone that can hold us. 
and we really, 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 really want them to be able to. And so we like, we open our heart and then a lot of guys are not capable, have not refined their skills as a jeweler to be capable of holding that. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to have an experience of being open in the world. It's just who do we want to share that part of ourselves within that kind of exchange. Have you got certain tips in order to, like what you do to keep your heart open as you walk through life? Yeah. (laughs) Definitely, definitely, definitely. And for me, like I've used the word God quite a few times today without um, a disclaimer on that. And that can be a trigger for people. Because if you're getting triggered by me using the word God, then we're definitely not talking about the same thing. <laughs> Most people have this like mental concept and religious concept of God to me. God is the, the source of all that is. It's all of existence. It's what makes the flowers grow towards the sun. And it's what makes you and I capable of loving each other. And it's just the, the energy that's inside of all of us, that purity of energy that's inside all of us. So for me, that's where my heart is the most open. Because when I'm connected to that, everything is okay. Everything is okay. And it always is okay. So anytime I'm in fear or loss or confusion or doubt or any of those things, I know that I'm not in my heart, I'm in my head. So my practices are all about getting out of the head and getting into the physical heart. And I do that by having a safe space. My physical environment is really important to me. I have this place, I have girlfriends like you, I have people who really see me for who I am and they remind me of the truth. And they say, you are so loved, Erin. You are so worthy. And this guy is not a reflection of your worthiness. He is not the one who determines how lovable you are. You know, like when other people can see the truth, they bring me back to myself. And I have this mantra that I use and I say to myself, I am a child of God. I am inherently lovable. Excuse me. I'm a child of God. I'm inherently lovable and nothing I can do can take that away. And I just say that again and again and again and again and again and again until I remember like, I am loved. I am lovable. Whatever's happening in the world around me and in the kingdoms of all the people that are in my world, like they don't determine how lovable I am. Like none of us, we are like, you look at a newborn baby and that energy, the purity of who they are is so evident. It's at the surface of who they are. And no one would question whether a newborn baby is inherently lovable, yeah. but we've lost contact with that part of ourselves. But you can see it in me. Mm. The other people I choose to have in my inner world can see it in me. And so they are a big part of my strategy for coming back, going to the places where you are seen and where you are loved and where you're understood and allow yourself to be reminded of who you really are through the reflections of those people. Yeah. I love that. And I love when you said, moving out of your heart and into your body that's what I'm all about as well and I think the moments in which I feel closed off from the world where I feel like I've closed my heart again sometimes all it takes is literally moving into my body you know like Mm. getting in in contact with my sensuality again like moving my hips like dancing closing my eyes like just like moving out of whatever stories I'm stuck in or or negative belief systems about myself that I'm stuck in and just like feeling And all of a sudden you become magnetic, like, you know, your energy shifts and change. And I think your heart, um, your heart opens and and just has this way of, of, of walking through life. That's different from when you're, when you're so hard on yourself, when that inner critic is just so loud. Yeah. So I would suggest people create those strategies from a really good place when they're in touch with it and they're feeling amazing. What are the things that will keep them there? Because once you're in the trigger, once you're in the depth of that pain and your heart's been broken again, and that same old story that no one is ever going to be able to love me, like everyone lets me down, I'm disappointed. Like we can't find the strategy from there. We're too triggered. But if you've already created a strategy, you've already told your girlfriends how to love you. Like you guys know how to love me. We have this group thread and I get in there and I'm like, (laughs) pour out all of my trigger, tell you what's going on. And you guys, when you've got the time and space, will get in there and validate me and love me and remind me of the truth and celebrate me. So I know I've got this safe place to go no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I know that you guys can hear me in my trigger and it doesn't influence you. I think that's really important. It's like when we recognize people are triggered, they're not seeing the truth. That just needs expression. Don't take on the opinions of the, what they're saying about the dude in that moment. Like, Be an observer, be separate to it, Mm -hmm. see the truth and not the trigger. 
and that's what you guys do for me. I can say any old witch blah in there and like, you guys keep loving me. <laughs> you guys bring me back to center, back to my heart. You validate me, you celebrate me, like create a place like that for yourself. Find the people that can see that in you and set it up verbally, have consent, have a conversation about it. What I need from you guys, like when I'm really triggered, can you please just listen to me? Don't fuel my fire. Don't agree with what I'm saying. Just listen. Tell me you understand. Can you touch me? Like physical contact for me is huge when I'm triggered. It makes me feel safe if someone just lovingly holds my arm and says, I understand. I get it. And they just let me blah, verbally process till it's spent. It's exhausted all its fuel. And then we come out the other side. Yeah. So important. Hey, like sometimes, and Leash does this for me all the time. She did this for me before I even had met her in, in, in human form, you know, she like I was having a moment and I didn't actually know what I need needed and I wasn't trying to vent to get validation I what like you whatever but I just like expressed this stuff and she just she just voiced me or called me or something and just said hey I just wanted to let you know that I'm here I know I'm not there physically but I'm over here holding your hand and I was just like oh that's exactly what I needed to hear like I don't need advice or to I don't need anything yes. right now except to know that somebody is hearing me and they and that it's there's, and there's nothing wrong with that and they get it and it's, and it's totally welcomed and they're there holding my hand in case I need any support. Exactly. And you know, energetically, like, as an, like it's real. It's a nice thing to say, but actually your energy entirely shifted when she projected her energy into, a way, into you in that way. Like that's where same energetically we feel violated to go back to the beginning of our conversation where people don't have nice boundaries and they want you, want you, want you, they are actually penetrating your energy field with that intention. And here you guys are with trust and with consent and understanding of each other. And she has been able to influence your energy in the way that you wanted and needed at that time. Mm -hmm. It's so real. Like when I say to people, Oh, I'm sending you love. Yeah. I can just say it, but I can legitimately send love. We all can. Yeah. And we can actually influence other people no matter where we are all the time we can make everyone's life better off that's certainly my mission make everyone's life better off for having me in it mm. yes you do by the way fyi <laughs> <laughs> thanks um, Annie. i wanted to ask as well like um what is what would you find i think i asked you what is the most valuable lesson you've learned from being in this place mm. that you're in right now what would you say is at the same time the biggest challenge that you're going through in this when as you're exploring this work I, I either heard the answer to that question before you asked it or you were tuned into my mind then and asked the right question because that's exactly what I wanted to share. Um, my dom had said to me, we can go to these places. Essentially, my confident, capable, intelligent Aaron is an armour that I've used to cover a very wounded part of me and underneath that, the wound still exists. And he said to me, if you want to we can go to those places and reclaim those parts of you and you can become more and more and more light oh, yes please <laughs> but it is so fucking scary and so fucking confronting to take that armor off mm. to even let it down a crack so that's the most challenging thing is that finally finally i've met someone that is a match to my defense system that is greater than my defense system. Cause up until now, my defense system was fucking awesome and no one was getting past this wall. I was the loving, capable, intelligent, strong Erin who thought she had her shit together. And every freaking time I think that life shows me a way to rip that out of my hands or pull down that wall. And now this is the deepest, 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 most inner protected hurt part of me that has been abused and had my innocence taken away and has been judged and, I've been judging myself. I've been holding so much shame and disgust and judgment towards what I wanted or what it meant if I want those things. And now I get to be loved in that place. I know that conceptually, but that does not make it any easier to let down that wall, to continue putting myself in that situation where I get to let down that wall. But to me, it is such a spiritual practice and I'm so freaking grateful because you and I both do the deep inner work all the time we are so brave and courageous no matter how hard no matter how scary and what the risk is we do the freaking work and now i get to do all the freaking work and have a lot of orgasms <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. actually 
a deeply pleasurable experience. It's not all about being confronted. It's not all about being challenged. It's actually also the embodiment of more and more and more and more pleasure than you could have ever imagined or allowed yourself to receive. And someone just wants to give it to you. That's it. It's just, it is as much a gift to receive that. So that's my word for 2020 because I have some huge blocks around receiving. I feel like obligated. I feel like I need to earn it. I need to give back. And when you're immobilized in ropes, you can't. <laughs> and someone still wants to pleasure you for hours. Like what a freaking gift. So that's really where I'm stretching myself this year is like, can I receive? So my two words for the year is erotic and receive. So it's like, how much pleasure can I expand? How much eroticism can I bring into every area of my life? How alive can I be? And how much can I truly just allow myself to receive? Mm. Unconditionally receive. Mm. I love that. I love that so much. Oh, what a chat. Like this is honestly yeah. like hours, but where can people go to access you. your journey? Read my mind again. I just wanted to say, if this conversation today has sparked some interest. No doubt it would have sparked some triggers as well. But for those people that are ready to take the next step, I really encourage you make sure your boundaries are really clear and that you know yourself really well before you step into this world. Because unfortunately there is a disproportionately large number of people that have come from a damaged environment that has led them there. And so sometimes the worst can be worse, but without doubt the better is better. The spectrum is larger. So for me, I have to have, be really clear on what I want and what's right for me and not right for me in this moment of time and have an ability to express that and talk about that to be able to navigate the world itself. So if you feel that you've got those things in place or you're ready to go further, then I would encourage looking in your local area for communities. So FetLife is a great avenue for that. Again, FetLife is just this oh, incredibly triggering world, but at the highest level of consciousness, it's also got great ways to find communities and find classes and to meet people who are doing it where you can take baby steps into it. But I'd be surprised if everyone, most people would have someone in their world that's already in this world, probably discreetly, because most people do choose to keep this private. So I would encourage you to talk about it with your friends and honestly just hand it over to life and say, okay, life, I want to explore this. And then life will show you the next step. Mm. So I do encourage everyone to do that, but definitely use me as an access point for that too. I'm really, really passionate about, like I said, creating non-sexual experiences for clients who can feel the safety and trust that I can hold and allow themselves to physically surrender. So I can see how it can create a sexual healing for people without the exchange of sexual energy, with nothing to do with you and I mingling our, our sexuality with me not giving any part of myself away with you not giving any part of yourself away and we can still be in a situation that's deeply healing in terms of our sexuality so i know i want to create that for clients um but i'll be launching a podcast and be creating heaps of resources around that kind of stuff so i'm on instagram at erin kiner i'm erin kiner everywhere basically my email is erin at erin kiner on facebook is erin kiner <laughs> you can't miss me i am the only one in the world Yes, because there you go. That says a lot. <laughs> There's no one else like you. So like, you know, if there was like, I'd probably come pretty close because sometimes I think we're the same human sometimes. Um, it's kind of my thing. <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing today. Like, I think you are an angel. I think you're an angel of light and dark because the world is duality and the world needs more of you. And I want to thank you for your courage that you constantly display and your bravery to live a risky life always on your edge because it inspires the fuck out of me every single day. And I'm so grateful that you walked into my life because you're my safe space. You're like a freaking angel and I love you so much. Thank you so much, Sammy. And technically you walked into my life. Thank you very much. I was sitting <laughs> at the cafe when you walked in. <laughs> but I freaking love you and I'm so grateful because you pushed me today. You created this space. It was what's coming for me and you gave me this beautiful, safe forum to take my first venture into sharing this part of myself in a public forum and I'm just so grateful that you did that for me I love you